Hello, Dr. Chan. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Sounds good. All right, it's uh, seven o'clock. Let's go and get started. All right, good evening, everyone. Everyone here. <laughs> How's everyone doing today? Doing good, doing good. All right. Okay, so today, uh, you know, I thought I'd do, we have a little bit of a break today. And so, uh, you know, I know our next ANSYS activity isn't planned until next week, uh, but we are a little bit ahead because I, I didn't realize the validation, or I, I guess I forgot. I forgot the verification and validation notes for only uh, one lecture's worth of content. Um, and so it's a little bit early to talk about the next activity just yet, because I know everyone's still working on activity six. 
Um, so what I thought I'd do today is, is go through uh, kind of a couple of the kind of the extra lecture notes that I have posted on Canvas uh, for some of the more niche um, and features. Okay. Um, and so in particular today, I wanted to go over heat transfer simulations and ANSYS and anisotropic materials and ANSYS uh, as well. Okay. Uh, just because these are these are a couple of things that I we you know we've mentioned throughout the class, and so I wanted to go over it today together, uh, just so that you know you can uh, just so that you're aware of it. And if you want to use it for the final project, then at least you know um, you know at least we were, we were able to go over in class at least. Okay. Um, so I don't I I don't think it's going to take that long today. You know we we're probably going to finish early. But I at least wanted to go over this uh, with you so that uh, you know if you want to use these features, you, you can use them. Okay, so today, uh, you know, it's we're I'm going to be using ANSYS today, but there's there's no activity that's due. You don't have to turn in anything. Um, you know, it's just today is just kind of a demonstration kind of uh, purpose. Okay, uh, but of course, if you want to follow along, you can. Um, it's just going to be cover. We're just going to cover kind of very basic stuff in ANSYS. Okay, um, <laughs> I think that is about it. Uh, that's kind of the plan for today. <laughs> Are there uh, any questions I can answer before we get started for today? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. And actually, the first thing I want to show you is, is if, if in case you've never seen it before, you know, I, I, I have a lot of these kind of extra lectures, um, or I guess extra handouts on posted on Canvas. Um, that are there for you uh, as well. So in case you've never seen it, let me show you kind of where it is right now. Okay, okay. and so if you go to our course here, so each of you 540, and you go to our files, right? If you click on the folder for lecture notes right here, you can see here that I have a lot of kind of extra lecture notes here at the bottom. So A1 through A6, okay? And so these are handouts that I've developed, um, you know, over the years. Um, you know, teaching quite a different finite element classes here at Cal State Fullerton. And so, you know, for a lot of these, you know, we were, we're not going to have enough time to cover them in the class itself. Um, you know, maybe in the last week if we if, if you guys want to see it. Uh, but I do find that they are still useful for you in, in, uh, in general. So I posted these for you in case you want to see. Today we're going to cover, be covering two of them. And so we're going to be covering A3. So A3 here is heat transfer simulations. And then A1 here is anisotropic materials. So we're gonna be covering both of those today. But you can see here that there are other handouts where if you wanna do fatigue life analysis, uh, if you wanted to know how to create extra surfaces and ANSYS, there's this one. I have a handout for fluid mechanics simulations uh, and one for harmonic response. Although we'll be covering kind of harmonic response next week uh, when we do modal vibration analysis. Okay. But that's that's in case you've, you've never seen them before that there's there's quite a few handouts there for your, for your information. Stop share. Okay, and so I, I want to start with the notes here just because heat transfer is something that's relatively new. Um, you know, I, I know probably a lot of you have taken a heat transfer course before, uh, but if you haven't taken a heat transfer course, then I, I do kind of want to introduce just kind of some, some basic concepts of heat transfer, just because it'll make it a bit easier to when we actually introduce the, the features within ANSYS. Okay. And so let's start with heat transfer simulations. Enhances. Okay. All right, so finite elements, uh, as you know, is, is a very kind of uh, broad kind of tool. Uh, you know, we've, we've mostly been using it for structural analysis, but in reality, you know, it, as long as your physical phenomenon is governed by a differential equation, which is, you know, most physical phenomenon, um, then, you know, you can model it within finite elements. One particular, uh, um, you know, area where finite elements is, is still is also very useful is in thermal analysis. And so the way that energy, um, or I guess the way that heat uh, moves throughout a surf, moves throughout a solid and, and kind of moves in general is governed by what's known as the heat equation.
So there's lots of different forms of the heat equation. Uh, the one that's most commonly used, at, at least in kind of a finite element courses, is the purely diffusive uh, version of it. Okay. So this is assuming no convection. So this is just kind of pure diffusion. And so if you're talking about heat transfer within a solid, you know, this uh, this equation here uh, works out pretty, pretty well. Okay. Okay. So the main thing that, uh, and, and kind of the main reason I kind of bring up this equation is to kind of uh, highlight- Dr. Sean. Yes. Uh, I have a question, sir. Sure. Um, so that equation that you listed, now um, I've never taken a formal background in heat. Um, having said that, I do have a strong background in fluids. Um, yeah. Is that equation the equivalent to the, uh, um, what's it called? Uh, the Navier-Stokes equation, but in heat? Or heat, oh, does that equation explain everything going on with heat? Is that the equivalent, the heat equivalent? Yeah, no, they're, they're very similar. In fact, you know, you, you often see, you know, thermal, thermal and fluids kind of get lumped together into the same area because their governing equations are quite similar. Um, and so this equation does look, it does share a lot of resemblances to the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, there are some things missing, of course. And so right now we don't have any convection in this, uh, in this equation uh, and we don't have any unsteadiness. So of course, this is, this is the steady form of the heat equation. Um, but they're but just like but just like this heat equation here, the the Navier-Stokes equations also have a diffusive term. So they have kind of second order derivatives in space in all the directions, and yeah, that's kind of the effect of viscosity in uh in Navier-Stokes. So yeah, there are a lot of similarities, and, and in fact they're they're often studied together. Yeah, that's a good it's a good observation. Okay, so the reason I bring up this equation here is to, is to kind of show you you know what you're ultimately solving for. Uh, in, in, in thermal analysis. Okay. And so if you look at the kind of the kind of the independent or the I guess the dependent variable in all of these uh, derivatives, you see you'll see it's at this big T. Okay. And so what that big that what that big T stands for here is uh, temperature. So that's going to be our primary output. And so the temperature, um, the temperature is, uh, you know, I think intuitively, I think everyone understands what temperature is, but kind of in a more kind of specific engineering sense, the temperature is kind of a, uh, an indicator for how much um, energy that this, the system is, is holding. Okay. And so generally the hotter an object is, the more internal energy, the more thermal energy it holds at any given time. Okay. Okay. And so with that said, you know, because our equation here is in temperature and we're not solving for deformations, then kind of our, our notions for, you know, what we consider to be like the boundary conditions are going to change. Okay? And so just like the, just like our structural equations, we're still going to have things like, um, you know, constraints and loads. <laughs> Except now, just uh, because you know our, our our equation is kind of fundamentally different, and what we're solving for is fundamentally different, you know what we consider to be a constraint and what we consider to be a load is going to be different as well. But you know th they're going to have the same effects on our solution. It's just that they're mostly going to be going by different terminology because our equation is kind of mostly different as, as well. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. 
so where would you apply, you know, thermal analysis? And so, you know, thermal analysis is, is used a lot, you know, in cases where, you know, you want to solve for, you know, where, where heating is going to be a, a valid thing. It's going to be a, a significant thing in your, uh, in your design. If you expect there to be, you know, changing material properties uh, with heat, uh, or maybe just looking to see if your part is going to melt or not. And so that's, that's all, that's also kind of a, uh, a consideration. So, and so, you know, I wanted to bring this up today because, you know, I know, um, you know, part of the final project is that you have to include an additional ANSYS feature and heat transfer actually makes a lot of sense for, for a lot of your, a lot of your projects. Uh, and so I want to make sure I, I had time to cover it in the class uh, today. Okay. Uh, so that's just kind of the introduction of what uh, heat transfer is. And so are there any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right, so let's jump right in. So let's let's talk about kind of how we actually set up these these kinds of uh, simulations and answers. So let's talk about geometry, connections, and mesh. Okay, so I'm lumping all these all these together because you know really in terms of the geometry and the meshing and the connections, you know not much is going to change. And so whether you're doing a structural simulation or a thermal simulation, you know, you're going to mesh your, your part in mostly the same, uh, mostly the same way. Okay. <clears throat> and so I'm not really going to comment on this because it's, uh, you know, it's not, not really much to say. The only thing I, the only thing I would say is that there is, because the heat equation, the heat equation actually is a little bit of an easier equation to solve than the structural dynamics equation or structural mechanics equation. And so you have a little bit more leeway in terms of choosing your, your meshing set. Um, are you inferring that heat simulations are less computationally expensive than st structural simulations? Uh, they are, yes. Sounds good. Yeah, and the reason for that is because in structural simulations, you know, you're, what you're mainly solving for is the deformation, right? And so the deformation is a vector quantity. And so you have to have that deformation in the X, Y, and Z directions. Um, for, the heat, for the heat equation, you're only solving for one unknown, right? And so temperature, temperature is not a vector quantity. Temperature is a scalar quantity. And so, you know, you're really solving a lot less equation per node. And so that ends up being a much cheaper simulation. I see. Thank you, sir. So for this, you know, you can, you can, you can, um, you can uh, be a little bit more lax in terms of your mesh. And so, you know, up until this point, you know, we've, we've kind of, we've kind of said that linear elements are not, uh, um, are not valid uh, elements at all. But for heat transfer simulation, actually linear elements are, are okay. Um, because in heat transfer simulations, you don't you don't run into you don't really run into issues like like um um I'm blanking on the name right now, like the uh, uh shear lock, like the shear locking phenomenon, uh because because you just have one temperature just to solve for per you know. So you know that helps you save a little bit more a uh, little bit more cost as well just by using linear elements. And so uh actually, you know, if you took a, a more, I would say a more foundational finite elements class, you know, one where we go through the theory. Actually, the, the the main equation that you're going to solve in those classes is the heat equation because it is, uh, I would say, kind of the easiest kind of equation to solve in multiple dimensions. And so, um, yeah. And if you if you're interested, and some of you are, some of you have taken it already, but if you if you end up taking 541 with me, you know you'll you'll probably be sick of the heat equation because uh, you know we're all we basically do in the class is solve it uh, in lots of different kinds of settings. And so, 
Um, so yeah, heat equation is, it's not, it's, I, I would say, you know, I, I don't bring it up too much in this class just because I know this is more of an applications-based class. And so I want to do applications that people find most relevant, but from a theory point of view, heat equation is a lot simpler. So you know, that's why that's presented there. So that's kind of one big difference. Okay, so geometry, connections, meshing, all of those are the same. So except, except you know, you have a little bit of extra, um, a little bit of extra leeway. So let's talk about boundary conditions. This is where things are going to be, uh, you're going to have the biggest difference. And so, of course, if you're running a thermal simulation with a very different um, governing equation, then your boundary conditions are all going to be different. And so let's talk about some of the more common ones um, that you that you'll probably use in practice um, and talk about what they mean. OK, so let's talk. Let's start with the most simple one. So let's start with the temperature boundary condition. And I would consider the temperature, the specified temperature boundary condition as a constraint type boundary condition. Okay. All right. So this is very similar to our, our kind of our idea of a fixed support and kind of our idea of a displacement type boundary condition. And so um, what these, what all of these boundary conditions have in common is that they uh, put a direct specification on the, on the primary solution. Okay. So for structural simulations, you know, our main solution variable was the deformation. And so by applying something like a fixed support or a displacement support, um, you know, we're directly specifying what those values should be. And so for the uh, specified temperature boundary condition is the same. Thing. Okay. The biggest difference that you'll see is that, you know, if, if for a fixed support, you know, you don't really have to specify a value for that because, you know, you're, you're basically setting the deformation equal to zero. But for a specified temperature, <coughs> you do have to specify what the value is. So I guess in reality, you know, the specified temperature boundary condition is most similar to like a displacement boundary condition where you have to specify values in addition to specifying, you know, what section is this going to be applied. Okay, so that's very straightforward. Next, let's go over uh, two types of boundary conditions, but I kind of love, I kind of love them together in the same. And so these are heat flow and heat flux boundary. I consider these to be like a load type. Okay. All right. So these, so these boundary conditions are basically analogous to an applied force or an applied pressure uh, in structural simulations. And so uh, what these specify is the total amount of um, energy or total amount of energy flux that passes through a particular surface on your model.
these types of boundary conditions are most useful when you um, when you want to learn something about um, or you want or you know something about the kind of like uh, the power that's generated outside of your outside of your geometry. And so let me give you an example. So let's say that you're running an ANSYS simulation of a combustion chamber. I draw a very crude drawing of one. So I know this is not what combustion chambers look like, but your imagination. Okay, so let's say we have a closed off chamber right here. And inside this chamber, we're gonna have some kind of combustion reaction. So, you know, let's say that we, a combustion is basically just a little, a, min, a miniature explosion. So, and we have some kind of explosion that goes on in the middle, okay? And so what you're interested in as an engineer is, you know, let's say you're interested in seeing, you know, how the heat, <coughs> how the heat from the combustion reaction dissipates through your chamber. Because an application like this, you know, a combustion chamber is going to be subjected to quite a lot of thermal loads um, throughout its uh, throughout its lifetime, right? Okay. And so, what's key to this uh, analysis is by you know computing or basically estimating exactly how much heating is going to go uh, from the combustion reaction out through the the chamber. Okay. <coughs> okay. And so one way that you can you can do this, and so oftentimes you you don't want to sim you don't want to simulate the combustion itself because that that's going to be really expensive. And so what you're going to do instead is you're going to make a CAD model of just the chamber. And so we're concerning ourselves with just the solid part of this chamber here, okay? And then to simulate the the combustion reaction. What you would do is you would you would specify a heat flux boundary condition on the inside. Right. And that heat flux boundary condition, or you know, the, the value that you put there. Is going to be equal to the amount of energy that's given off by the combustion reaction. Okay. Because oftentimes, you know, a combustion reaction is a very complex kind of chemical um, fluid thermal thing happening, right? But oftentimes, you know, based on just the chemical constituents of just how much fuel you're putting in, how much air you're putting in, how much oxygen you're putting in, you know, you could compute, you know, fairly easily how much energy you're expecting that to, to give off, right? And so you could specify that directly as a heat flux boundary condition that tells you how much energy is, is coming through, how much energy is coming through your, your solid, basically. So heat flux uh, or heat flow boundary condition, very common um, and very useful in a lot of situations. Okay. All right, any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right, so let's go over a special case of a heat flow boundary condition. Okay. And so a special case of a heat flow boundary condition is one where it's perfectly insulated.
Um, Dr. Chan. Yes. I have a question. Sure. Um, so we're going over heat flux and all that good stuff. And given my minimal knowledge of heat, um, does FEA make use of the heat capacity value? It does. It does. Okay. Yeah. So that, okay. that is definitely a property that you can include uh, within um, within ANSYS itself. Um, okay. and in fact, it's, it's a required quantity. It's a required it's property. It's very important for heat applications. I know that. Yes. 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 So I was um, just wondering. Sounds good, sir. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a perfectly insulated boundary condition is actually a special case of a heat flow boundary condition. And so technically speaking, that means perfectly insulated is a is a load type boundary condition. So it's not, it's not a constraint. People think of it as like a constraint type boundary condition, but it's actually a load, okay? So a perfectly insulated type boundary condition means that, you know, if you're specifying that on a surface, that means that no heat flow or no heat flux can occur through that surface. Right, so think of like uh, think of like like an insulating oven mitt or something like that. Right, so those those are designed in a way where you know very little heat can actually go through. I will say that you know per, there's no such thing in real life as a perfectly insulated surface, and so whenever you have a temperature difference between two objects, you know even if you have you know the most insulating material in the world, you know there's still going to be some heat transfer that occurs through that surface. That's just that's just how nature works. Um, but oftentimes that for, for certain conditions, you know, that amount of heat is so negligible that you can basically assume that it's perfectly insulated. So um, this case does, it is fairly common, even though technically there's no such thing as perfectly, a, 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 an absolutely perfect insulation, uh, it can still be a, a useful approximation in a lot of cases. Okay. okay. All right, so the next one is, is kind of a big one. So this, this next one's called convection. <coughs> okay, so convection, uh, when you talk about convection and heat transfer, you know, what you're referring to is heat transfer to some kind of flowing fluid. The most common, the most common fluid that uh, that you can have here is air, and so you know a lot of objects are air cooled. And if you have some kind of air that's flowing over your object, then that flowing air is going to enhance the amount of heat transfer that comes out. Okay. And so that's why, you know, if you, if you have a hot cup of coffee or if you have a hot bowl of soup, you know, the way, the way that you cool it down is you blow, you know, over, over, the, over the, the hot liquid, right? It's not that your breath is any colder than the outside air. In fact, it's probably warmer. But the fact that you're moving the food and, and you're, causing, you're causing it to move, that's going to uh, enhance the heat transfer, okay? Same thing with wind chill. And so wind chill, you know, the way people think of wind chill, I think, is a little bit misleading because when, when people think of wind chill, you know, people think like, oh, the temperature is actually lower than it is with wind chill. That's not actually the case. And so wind chill doesn't make the temperature colder. You know, it just feels like it's colder because, you know, with the wind chill, you know, more heat is leaving your body compared to the same temperature, you know, without the wind chill. Right? 
But the reason we we say that with wind chill that you know the temperature drops is because that's that's a little bit easier for people to understand. But you know it doesn't actually drop the temperature; it just enhances the heat transfer out of your body. Okay. okay. So visually, you know the uh, uh, convection is usually visualized by this uh, by this diagram. So if you have some kind of surface. And your surface is at some temperature Ts. You have a moving fluid that goes on top of it. And so your surface is temperature Ts. T infinity here is the temperature of the fluid. Then the formula that we have um, for that governs convection is known as Newton's law of cooling. All right. And so Q, where Q here is the amount of heat transfer that leaves the surface. Q here is equal to H times A times the difference in temperatures. So Ts minus T infinity. And so a lot of these quantities are, are fairly straightforward to, um, to, to, uh, to see, okay? And in terms of ANSYS, there's, there's only a couple parameters here that you have to set, okay? Okay, so TS here, TS is the surface of our object or surface temperature of our object. So that's something that you don't have to compute uh, or you don't have to specify yourself because that's just gonna be whatever you solve for in the simulation. Okay. A here, A here is the surface area. <coughs> and so that's, a, that's also one thing that you don't have to compute because the ANSYS can compute that on its own. But the two things that you do have to provide, that you do have to specify to ANSYS are the values for H and T infinity, okay? So H here, this is known as a convection coefficient. Okay. We'll go over that soon in a bit. And T infinity here, again, is the temperature of the fluid. So both both uh, terms there that I've circled in red, uh, if you are supplying a convection boundary condition in ANSYS, you have to give values for these quantities. So T infinity is, is usually not too hard to specify. And so, you know, for most, for most cases, you know, if, uh, if your object is being exposed to like air, like uh, normal air temperature, then you specify just whatever temperature the air is outside or whatever the temperature the air is in the room, okay? 
H here is, is complicated. So H here, H here kind of is, it's kind of a combination of all kinds of, uh, of thermal fluid effects from the fluid itself. Okay, so in essence, H, H is gonna measure how strong the convection heat transfer is for that fluid. Okay. And in reality, H here depends on a lot of different things. And so it depends on, um, you know, it depends on the velocity of the fluid. It depends on kind of the properties of the fluid, the density, its thermal capacity. It depends on the flow patterns. Uh, it depends on the geometry. And so H actually depends on a lot of things. And so uh, basically what I'm getting at here is that you can't really look up H in a table because it's, it's, it's literally different for every situation. And so if you can't look up H in a table, you know, what can you really do? Well, um, unfortunately, you know, even, even if you've taken, even if you've taken a heat transfer class and even if you've learned some methods for computing H, those methods are still very limited, I would say. So I would say that kind of, if you really want to get a, a, an accurate value for H, you kind of have to run a fluid mechanics simulation kind of on the side of your, of your geometry, which is, you know, not really something that I'm going to expect you to do for this class. And so, you know, if you do want to have a convection boundary condition, and you should, you know, a lot of times, you know, convection is pretty relevant for a lot of cases. You know, generally the approach that I say is that is, is to, you know, try to see if you can look in the literature. And so search up some scientific papers or maybe some, um, you know, maybe some simulations that people have done on, uh, on situations that are similar to yours. Uh, and then see what values they have for H, then use something similar. So um, just for clarification, um, you recommend um, we look at the literature that's available. And if that's not the case, uh, um, a thermodynamic simulation has to be completed to obtain a sufficient value for H. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah, so it, so you know the the tricky thing with convection, you know that's this is kind of the the difficulty with convection, and so you know you look at a formula like this, you know it's a, it's a relatively simple formula, but kind of buried beneath that formula is is a parameter here that is very very difficult to obtain, and so um, and so you know there there are tools within ANSYS where you can compute H, um, but those are kind of you know a little bit complicated to set up because you have to set up a fluid mechanics simulation in order to, to do that, so. You know, for, for this class, if you do plan on using thermal simulations for your final project, um, you know, I, I think probably the best conversation, the best way to do is just to kind of have a conversation with me and we'll look up and see, you know, what are reasonable values for H in, in those applications. Um, and then we'll roll, we'll, we'll roll with that. But, you know, getting a precise value for H can be, can be very difficult. Okay. All right. Um, any questions on convection here? Okay. Convection number four. Okay, so now let's go over radiation. The often forgotten uh, mode of heat transfer. Okay, so radiation is uh, even in, even if you take a heat transfer class is is not usually it's usually not covered in detail. And and I will admit that you know I have very limited knowledge of how radiation actually works. But the but the definition for radiation is it's it's basically heat transfer from a surface that occurs through electromagnetic waves. Okay. 
<laughs> basically through through light, right? So this is the same form of heat transfer that that basically makes sure that heat from the sun can reach the surface of, of the earth. Okay. Because in between the sun and the earth, there's absolutely nothing. So it's just it's just empty space. And so you can't use a traditional form of heat transfer like conduction or convection, as those require some kind of matter to exist in between between the two. And so the only way that we can get heat, get energy from the sun is through radiation. Okay, so radiation can occur in a vacuum, which is, which is very unique. Okay, but oftentimes, you know, if you're talking about heat transfer applications on Earth, you know, usually we neglect radiation because its magnitude is so small. Okay, just leave the light off. And so unless, unless you're doing a, an application for heat transfer that is in space, and so unless you're doing like, you know, heat transfer off a satellite or something like that, most of the time it's, it's okay to ignore radiation. It's just not even cool. Technically, it's always there though. So technically speaking, you know, all objects are radiating heat. It's just that the magnitude is so small compared to, you know, conduction and convection that we usually just ignore it, okay? But the formula for it is given by the following. So the heat transfer via convection or radiation is given by Q, which is equal to epsilon times sigma B, which I'm going to define in a second. Multiplied by the temperatures to the fourth power. Okay. So Ts to the fourth minus T infinity to the fourth, where those two quantities have the same uh, interpretation as convection. So Ts here would be the temperature of the surface, and T infinity would be the temperature of just the ambient uh, environment or ambient fluid. Okay. Okay. And so let's start with uh, sigma b. So this is known as the Boltzmann's constant. It's some um, you know constant in, uh, in in applied physics. It has a very very small value, and so it's something like times ten to the minus eight or nine or something like that. And so you know that's why this, that's why radiation ends up being very small. Okay. Well, once again, just like convection, I'm going to circle the things that you have to specify in radiation uh, in order for it to work. So T infinity here is the ambient temperature. Okay, so that's relatively straightforward. So that's just the temperature of whatever the environment is surrounding your object. Okay. okay. And epsilon here is called the emissivity. And so emissivity is a property of your surface that uh, basically specifies how well your surface gives off electromagnetic fields. And its value can range from zero to one.
Right. So luckily, you know, unlike unlike the convection coefficient, emissivity is is actually something you can actually look up in a table. So most surfaces, depending on you know, um, depending on on how the surface usually, or depending on on the properties of the object, you can look up its typical emissivity. Right? You can you can you can change this, of course. And so there's uh you know, depending on what you do to the surface, you could scuff it up, or you can make it shiny to make it you know give, improve or you know. Um, Make worse the emissivity, but you can get, kind of get a general sense for the emissivity if you look it up in a table. Okay. okay. Uh, any questions on on radiation? Right. So most of the time you're going to ignore it, and so most of the time you're just not going to worry about the emissivity, but uh, you know, uh, or you're not going to worry about radiation. But the option is there in case you want to. Okay, and so the last one I want to go over, it's not really a boundary condition, but you know, we kind of lump it in the same, is called internal heat generation. Okay. So in her, internal heat generation is an additional condition that you could specify for objects that can kind of generate heat on its own. Okay. All right, so what do I mean by generate heat? So, you know, that seems kind of like a, like a paradoxical statement, you know, because it's not, it's impossible to create energy from, from nothing, right? Um, but you, and, and while that's true, you can't, you can't convert energy from nothing. Um, it is possible to convert energy from one form to another. And so, you know, um, the, I think the most, uh, the easy ex example of this is like some kind of electric heater, okay? And so an electric heater will convert, you know, electrical energy to thermal energy, and so if you look at just kind of just the thermal energy of the system, it's going to look like the object is generating heat when it's actually, you know, converting electrical energy to heat. So um, you could, you could, you could account for those types of objects and answers by specifying an internal heat generation. Okay. okay. All right. So that actually took longer than I thought. So I think probably won't, we won't have time for anisotropic materials, um, but we'll cover that in a future, uh, future case. Okay. And so for the rest of class today, I did want to go through an example because I did promise you that we do some answers today. Okay. Um, and so let's do a simulation of a cylindrical fin. Okay. So the situation looks like this. So we're looking at a side profile of the of the cylinder, and so it's going to look like a rectangle here. On one side, we're going to have a specified temperature. And so we're going to have a specified temperature of 100 degrees C. Okay. On the right-hand side, we're going to have a perfectly insulated condition. And the dimensions for this is we're going to have a length of 100 centimeters. The diameter of this is going to be five centimeters. And we're going to have convection over the top. So we're going to have a convection with T infinity is equal to 25 degrees C and H equal to 0 0.5 watts per meter squared. Okay, so what's going to happen here is that uh, basically we have a fin where on one side we have a specified temperature, and that fin is going to offload heat into the fluid that's surrounding. So let's say that you know for this particular case, let's say that the that the uh, that the fin is going to be cooled by air. Okay? And so what's going to happen is the heat is going to the fin is going to lose heat in the fluid, okay? and what you'll see is that the the, the temperature is going to drop along the edge of the. Fluid. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to set this up in ANSYS so that you can kind of see, uh, you know, how to set this up, how I set the boundary conditions, uh, 
and all that, all that good stuff. Okay, any questions on this before we jump, we jump into answers? Okay, all right, so let me go ahead and switch. Okay. Okay, so here's how you set up a thermal simulation in ANSYS. And so, you know, here we have, here we're back on ANSYS workbench right here. Okay. And then on the left-hand side here, we're going to look at our normal analysis systems. But instead of a static structural, I'm going to use this, uh, I'm going to use this uh, analysis system here, which is steady state therm. Okay. So I'm going to click and drag this to the, uh, uh, to the uh, project area here. Okay. And next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make our geometry. Because... I didn't make it beforehand because I was, uh, I forgot. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, luckily this geometry is very simple. So let's go ahead and just sketch something in this plane right here. Let's make sure our units are good. So let's make sure our units are in centimeter. Okay. 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 So let's go ahead and draw a circle. We're going to center it on the origin. We're going to dimension this. We're going to give it a dimension of five centimeters. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's go back to a modeling here. We have our one sketch. Let's go ahead and extrude this. So let's go ahead and apply that to our sketch. And we're going to extrude it by 100 centimeters. All right. So let's go ahead and hit generate. All right. So we have our fin here, right? And so it's basically a cylinder with a diameter of five centimeters and a length of a hundred centimeters. Right? So I did that very quickly just because the geometry generation is not that important for this. And so I want to kind of more show you how to set up the thermal simulation. Okay, so let's go ahead and close design modeler. So our geometry is updated. Let's go ahead and double click model. So we're going to open up Ansys Mechanical. Okay, so now we're in Ansys Mechanical. You can see here we have our fin, right? And so we're going to go through the, our usual process of meshing, uh, boundary conditions, and so on and so forth. Okay. All right. So first thing, I guess. Oh, I guess first thing I forgot to mention is we're assuming assuming the uh, um, the rod here or our fin is made of structural steel. Okay. So I think it is. Yep. So we're going to uh, keep the structural steel, and the reason for that is that structural steel, you know, is is the is the default material in ANSYS. Um, and it actually has all the thermal properties kind of pre-specified as well. And so there's not really much we have. Okay. okay, so first thing we're let's generate a mesh. So let's see what our um, what our mesh looks like at first. Okay. So that looks not bad, but I do want to make it a bit more fine. And so let's make sure the units here are centimeters. Okay. And so for this, let's set a mesh size of a, uh, let's go one centimeter. So let's see, see what that does for our mesh. Okay, okay so now we have, a, we have a mesh with about 2,800 elements, 2,900, uh, and we have several elements through the thickness. So this looks, this looks adequate to me, so this looks fine. Okay, so let's go ahead and specify the boundary conditions. So we have quite a few boundary conditions we need to specify here. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is we need to specify our, uh, our support type boundary condition or our constraint type. Okay. Uh, and so remember, <coughs> for a thermal simulation, our constraint type boundary conditions are going to be temperature. And so to specify a temperature type boundary conditions, we're going to right click on steady state thermal. We're going to go to insert here. And then we're going to click on temperature boundary condition. Okay. And so this lets us specify a certain surface to have a certain temperature. So let's go ahead and click that. All right. And so I'm going to click on one side of the cylinder here, and we're going to apply that. And we're going to set this magnitude here to be 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. Just like our uh, just like our problem statement set. Okay. okay. And then the other type of boundary condition we're going to put here is a perfectly insulated condition. And so if you read the tooltip for this perfectly insulated condition, 
you could see here that it specifies a face on which there will be no heat flow. Okay? So we want to make sure that the other end of the, of the fin here has no heat flow. Okay? So we're going to specify that. And, and uh, crossing this is going to be zero watts of, of energy. So that's, that's good. Okay, and so last thing we're gonna specify here is a convection type boundary condition. Okay. And so just like before, we're gonna right click static uh, steady state thermal, go to insert and then go to convection here. Okay. And so you can see here, you can read the tooltip. And so convection causes convective heat transfer through one or more surfaces that's in contact with the fluid. Okay. And so basically what we're assuming is that we have air that's flowing over the top of this fin, okay, all the way around it. And so there's going to be heat loss from the fin to the fluid as it flows around. Okay. And for this, we need to specify the entire outer surface of the fin because those are those are the parts that are exposed to air. Okay. And then if you go to the details menu here at the bottom left, you can see here we have two things we need to specify here. So we need to specify what the ambient temperature is, and we need to specify what the film coefficient is. And so the film coefficient is the same thing as the convection coefficient, right? Okay, so for the ambient temperature, we know it is 25 degrees C. Okay. For the film coefficient, if you if you if you remember from the from the notes, it has a value of 0 0.5 watts watts per meter squared Kelvin. So Kelvin and degrees Celsius are the same thing. So degrees Celsius. Okay, and so you want to be careful here. You know, you want to be careful of your units. And so, you know, I change, oops. and so I changed the units here to centimeters for uh, for defining the mesh. But you can see here that our fill coefficient here is in watts per centimeter square degree C. Okay, so let me go back and change the units back to uh, watts per meter squared C, so I can uh, make sure I specify this fill coefficient in the right units. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and specify this as zero point five. Okay, so we have our temperature boundary condition. We have our insulated boundary condition. We have our convection uh, boundary condition here. And so we're all set uh, to run our simulation. So before we do that, uh, let's go ahead and specify some outputs. And so let's specify the temperature as an output so we can see what it looks like. And then let's also specify the total heat flux as a uh, output as well. And I'll kind of explain that you know, once, after we run. Okay, so let's go ahead and run our simulation. So let's go ahead and look at our temperature here. And so you can see our temperature uh, on the left-hand side has a value of 100 degrees C. And so that's just like what our, our constraint type boundary condition specified. And then as we go to the right of the fin, you can see here that the temperature is dropping because as we go along the fin, you know, heat is being lost in the fluid that's surrounding it. Okay. And so that causes the temperature in the fin to drop. It doesn't drop that much, or I guess, you know, 20 degrees Celsius is kind of a lot, I guess. And so it goes from about 100 degrees Celsius to 80 degrees Celsius, okay? Okay, so let's look at the heat flux now. And so you can see here that the heat flux, you know, in terms of colors uh, has roughly the same, uh, you know, roughly the same pattern as the temperature. Uh, but of course the units and the interpretation for this is different. And so the heat flux here, you know, this tells you how much heat is exiting the, uh, the domain at each section of our geometry here, okay? So we have the most heat loss at the beginning here. And so we have the most heat loss where the temperature is the highest, uh, which makes sense. But then as the rod cools off, you know, it becomes harder and harder for the temperature to, or it becomes harder and harder for the heat to leave the, uh, uh, the geometry here, okay? So you can see here at the very end, the very end where we specified a heat loss of zero, uh, the heat loss kind of slowly kind of changes from, from then to then. All right, any questions on, on this here? Okay. All right, so one last thing I wanna show you. So let's see what happens when we increase the convection coefficient. And so let's increase this by a factor of 100. And so let's increase this to 50. And so by increasing the convection coefficient, we're increasing the amount of heat loss that the fin is experiencing uh, to the fluid, okay? And so intuitively, you would expect that, you know, if, if the fluid here were moving faster, 
that it's going to cause more heat loss from the uh, from the fin. So let's see if that's true. Okay, and so by increasing the convection coefficient uh, to fifty, you can see here that we have a lot more heat loss. And so if you look at the minimum temperature here, it's a lot lower than it was before. So it goes down to almost the temperature of the fluid here, uh, which is twenty five. Okay, and if you look at the total heat flux, you know we see kind of a similar pattern where the heat flux is much more enhanced on the left side because of the uh, of the enhanced uh, convection velocity or convection uh, coefficient. Okay, all right. And so um, I think that's about it. My nose is completely bugged right now. So I, it's hard for me to breathe right now. And so I think we'll save anisotropic materials for, uh, for another time. Uh, any final questions on heat transfer simulations and answers before we, uh, we close it up for today? Um, is this the end of uh, today's lecture? Uh, say it again, Ivan. Sorry. Um, are you ending the lecture? Yes. Yes. This is okay. the. Uh... Sounds good, sir. Okay. All right. If there's no more questions, that's all I got for today. And so on Monday, when we come back, uh, we'll be talking about. Uh, vibration analysis. And so, you know, that is the subject for activity seven. And so activity seven will learn how to do modal analysis and vibration analysis and ANSYS, which is, uh, which is very cool, very cool thing to do. Okay. And then next Wednesday, we'll, we'll carry out activity seven. Okay. All right. So thank you guys for coming today. I hope you guys enjoy uh, the rest of your week. Hope you guys enjoy your weekend and I will see you on Monday. Thank you, Dr. Shaw and have a nice weekend. Thanks. You too, Ivan. Thanks, Professor. Thanks, Trevor. Yep. I just want to ask the video I sent you about the earthquake. Thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. How different is it from what we're going to be learning? Uh, we're going to be doing a much simpler analysis for that. So we're not we're not going to be um, we're not actually going to be like simulating an earthquake um, on our part. We're mostly going to be interested is, is what we're mostly going to be interested in is, is finding out what the natural frequency of our object is and kind of what the modes look like. And so if you were, if you were to simulate, you know, with, uh, with that vibration frequency, there's a, there's a certain kind of way that your object is going to deform. And so we'll, we'll be able to see the patterns for that, uh, but we're not going to do it as sophisticated as, as what they do. I, I was the talking about the, the final project, what if I, do that for the final because this is something that Tyler and me are actually talking about. Oh yeah. And we've just like talking about doing something different. I have thought of doing something with the related to an earthquake, but we're thinking about how to do it. But I just found this video. Yeah. So we thought we'll do something similar. Can we is that is that possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could you could definitely it's do it. It's like that. super complicated. So we're like, let's just try with doing that. Yeah. Let's start with activity seven and then you'll see how that relates. Though there, there are parts of activity seven that relate to the video that you okay. sent us. But um, I, I would only expect for the final project, I would only expect kind of up to what we do for activity seven, but you could definitely go way beyond that if you want and do kind of a lot more kind of sophisticated stuff if you want to. So yeah, definitely go for it. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah.